May grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God, the Father, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Word of God, which is the basis of the sermon this morning, is found in the Gospel according to Luke. Luke chapter 24, verses 50 to 53 where we read as follows that portion of God's word, which will be the sermon text. And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him, and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. So far the text. In the name of Jesus, who is with us always until the end of the world, dear fellow redeemed sinners and creatures of the one true, only living, creating, and preserving triune God. Forty days after the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Forty days, we would say now, after Easter. Forty days, this event occurred that we have just read about here in Luke. Jesus led his followers, it said, out as far as Bethany. Now Bethany was a little village on the Mount of Olives, just east of Jerusalem. And so Jesus leads the 12 apostles, now numbering 11 since the loss of Judas. He leads the apostles out to the Mount of Olives, to the top of the mountain. And the events here recorded occurred. He led them out as far as to Bethany. And he lifted up his hands and he was parted from them. His hands. Jesus' hands. Hands are so important. God gave us hands for a very good reason. All that we do, we do with our hands. Almost everything. And if we're right-handed, almost everything we do is with our right hand. Or left-handed with our left hand. Think about what you could do without your hands. Hands are so important. Jesus, who had also become a true man, he is God Almighty, but he became also a true man. He had real human hands. And he lifted up these hands. And the apostles are looking at Jesus as he raises his hands over them. And what were the apostles thinking about this, I wonder? As they looked upon Jesus' hands, were they thinking of these hands that Jesus had raised in that black darkness that night on the Sea of Galilee when they thought they were going to die? When the great storm arose and their ship was sinking and Jesus stood up raised his hands and said, Peace, be still. And he calmed that great storm. The power that is in these hands of Jesus. And as they're looking upon Jesus' hands, did they think of that great power that were in Jesus' hands? Much more than the power of our hands. Well, we know what they said on that occasion, the Bible tells us, that after Jesus had calmed the great storm, the apostles responded by saying among themselves, what manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and water, and they obey him. These were not the hands of just any old man. 
These were the hands of the God-man, Jesus, God the Son, who came down from heaven and became a true man with a true human body, but whose hands now have all power in heaven and on earth. They asked at that time on the Sea of Galilee, what manner of man is this? Well, now they know. A few years later, as they stand on the top of the Mount of Olives, now they know what manner of man he is. They know he is God. And it says here in our text at the end, uh, at, in verse, verse 52, and they worshiped him. They worshiped him because he is God. He stood before them also as a man, but they knew now what manner of man he is. He is God, become also a true man. And now Jesus Christ, the God-man, he holds his hands over these apostles that he has chosen. And as he holds his hands over them, he begins to rise up off the ground and go up and up and up into the sky, still holding his hands over them. And these hands will now hold the scepter of almighty power. Those hands rule all heaven and earth to this day. All nature obeys Jesus' will. All creation, the whole universe, obeys Jesus' will, except man. Except human beings, the descendants of Adam and Eve. The Bible says, God speaking, Fear ye not me, saith the Lord. Will ye not tremble at my presence, which have placed the sand for the bound of the sea by a perpetual decree that it cannot pass it? And though the waves thereof toss themselves, yet can they not prevail. Though they roar, yet can they not pass over it. But this people hath a revolting and a rebellious heart. They are revolted and gone. Even the great oceans God controls with his almighty power and they obey him. They will not go beyond the seashore, which he has set bounds to. Everything obeys God, but this people, they revolt and rebel and do not obey God. Jesus ascended back into heaven visibly, but just as visibly as he left, he is coming again to judge this disobedience, this rebellion, this revolting of human beings. He is coming again to judge it. These hands are also the hands of a judge that he raised over the apostles before he ascended back to heaven. He lifted up his hands, it says here. He lifted up his hands and he was parted from them. Those almighty hands that control everything in the world and in the universe. But the apostles as they looked on must have been thinking not just of those hands in terms of their almighty power to control everything. But they also must have noticed something else about those hands. How they had been so scarred and ripped and torn 
by the nails, the spikes that had nailed them to the cross a few days before. Those scars, those nail prints of Jesus' crucifixion were still in his hands, his almighty hands, and looking upon his hands, they had to see those terrible scars. And that reminded them why Jesus had come down from heaven in the first place. Why God the Son had come down, sent by God the Father to become a true man, it was to die. For the wages of sin is death. And even though Jesus never sinned, he was come to die to pay for the disobedience, the rebellion of all men to God. To take upon himself our sins and pay the full price of them before God's almighty throne of judgment. As they looked upon Jesus' raised hands, they must have remembered how 40 days earlier they would not believe that Jesus had risen when the first reports came in that he had risen. But they were thinking, we've got to see those terrible scars in his hand and in his feet and in his side. Only then will we believe that the dead can rise. Only then will we believe that Jesus, who was crucified three days earlier, has risen. They had to see, and one even had to touch, Jesus' hands with those spike prints. And so now with these nail-pierced hands lifted up, Jesus begins to rise off of this earth visibly, triumphantly, gloriously, proving that his saving work was completely finished. He had accomplished his purpose for coming to this world perfectly. He had paid for all of the sins of every human being in the world. Do not look for salvation anywhere else. Do not look for salvation anywhere other than in those nail-pierced hands of Jesus. There is your hope. The Bible says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect it is God that justifieth, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. After Jesus had ascended, Jesus had gone away visibly from them and they would not see him again until he comes again in glory on the last day. How were they feeling, do you think? How would these apostles who've just seen Jesus, who they have lived with intimately for the last three and a half years, their best friend, their rabbi, their teacher, their master, their savior, their God, now he has ascended. He's not with them now, visibly. 
physically. They may well have been grief stricken as we would be when we lose a close relative or friend. They may well have been grief stricken, heartbroken. They wouldn't see Jesus again physically until they were dead and their souls had been taken to heaven. Or they, they could have felt fearful and in fact terrified because now their protector was not with them. They could have been thinking to themselves, now we're all alone. Now we're without Jesus. And he has given us this immense task of carrying his message of good news and salvation into a world that hates us and wants to kill us. They could have been terrified. But they weren't. As the Bible tells us here, instead they returned to Jerusalem remembering those hands. Those hands. Reaching out over them to bless them. He led them out as far as to Bethany and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them. He was parted from them. That's what they were thinking. They were remembering those hands blessing them. Those same hands that had reached out to the Apostle Peter a little time before. Again on the Sea of Galilee when there was a great storm and the Apostles thought they were going to drown on that occasion. But Jesus came to them walking on the water. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, if it be you, let me come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. And Peter began to walk on the water himself toward Jesus. But then he looked at the wind and the waves and he became fearful and doubted and began to sink. And he said, Jesus, save me. And Peter reached his hand out and Jesus reached his hand out and caught Peter's hand. That same hand that now was raised over Peter to bless him that saved him that night on the Sea of Galilee. They knew that Jesus, even though he had left them physically and visibly, did not mean that he did not love them, that he did not care for them, but rather he was only gone visibly and was still with them, still blessing them wherever they went. He was with them at all times. Jesus had promised them only a few days before, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So, as it says in our text, while he blessed them. While he blessed them, he was parted from them. In verse 51, note that word. While. While. Doesn't say that when he had finished blessing them, he ascended. It says while. While he blessed them, he was parted from them. He ascended and he continued as he ascended to bless them and speak blessings to them and words of comfort to them. Because his blessings didn't end that day. He continues to bless all of the saints, all of the believers, all of his disciples, all who trust in him alone. He continues to this moment holding his hands of blessing and speaking words of peace and comfort to all of his disciples. His blessings haven't ended. He still continues to bless all of his disciples. So the last picture of Jesus is of him raising his hands and speaking words of blessing over his disciples. 
Thus, there is something cheering, not sad, on this occasion. As it says, they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. It wasn't a sad occasion. It was a joyful occasion. It was a hopeful occasion. They had just seen Jesus, God the Son, rise up and return to heaven, his home. It was such a peaceful scene. You think of uh, the uh, prophet Elijah in the Old Testament, how he went to heaven. Oh, it was violent. It was a fiery chariot. Horses of fire, chariots of fire, coming down, swooping Elijah up into the sky. Wasn't that way with Jesus? Slowly, he rises into the clouds, blessing his disciples as he went. No violent whirlwind, no agitation of the air, no blaze of glory dazzled the eyes of the apostles. It was not a terrifying sight. It was one of peace and blessing and hope and joy. That blessing is for all of us. All of us who believe in Jesus, that he is our Savior. It is for all of us to think of Jesus' last visible appearance in this world in that way, a sign of joy for those who believe. Unfortunately, many refuse to believe. Many refuse to believe in Jesus as their God and their Savior their only hope. But these, these disciples, these apostles that day on the Mount of Olives, they weren't like that. Those who saw Jesus ascend visibly, they did believe in him, and so they were not sad, and they were not afraid. But as it says here, they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. They went back to, into Jerusalem and waited for the promised Holy Ghost, the third person of the Trinity that would come upon them in 10 days on the day of Pentecost. It's a time of great joy and victory. They remember Jesus' hands. And they were, as it says here in verse 53, were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. How often did they go to church? Once a year? Twice a year? Just on the big festivals? Whenever they thought about it, whenever they had nothing better to do? No, they were continually, continually in God's house. They went to church every time there was an appointed worship service. They were now using their hands to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. They were using their hands, folding them in God's house in prayer. When you are tempted by Satan to be absent at an appointed service in God's house, remember those hands of Jesus and how you should be folding your hands in God's house, as did the apostles. Not only holding them in prayer, but holding in their hands the Word of God, the Bible, in God's house. Or holding in your hands and turning the pages of the Bible in your homes or in Bible study, using your hands that Jesus gave you to serve him. And then go out into the world and use your hands in whatever Jesus has given your hands to do in this world. Use it to his glory and in his service. And when you look at your hands, remember 
Jesus' hands, his almighty hands. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all of man's understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.